was the night before Christmas, when all through the pod, not a creature was stirring, not even the dog. The rocket was left on the launch pad with care, in the hopes that St. Korolev soon would be there. The engineers were nestled, all snug in their beds, while visions of trajectories danced in their heads. And Khrushchev in his PJs, and I in my red star cap, had just shut things down for a short Christmas nap. When out on the pad there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my station to see what was the matter. Away to the platform, I ran like in the war, tore open the blast shutters and threw open the door. A moon that will soon be red lit up the snow. I hoped that the fuel did not once again blow. When what to my wondering eyes did I see through a shutter partition? But a patriotic red sleigh pulled by eight tired technicians. With a short old driver educated in Kiev, I knew in that moment he must be Saint Korolev. Exhausted and slow, his technicians seemed lame. But they pulled even harder when he listed their names. Now Dmitri, now Daniel, now Vadim, now Pavel. On Kolya, on Kirill, on Grisha, on Mel. To the top of the tower, to the top of the rocket. Now dash away, dash away, and you won't get shot yet. So up to the top of the rocket they flew, with a sleigh full of goods, and St. Korolev too. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the rocket the chime and thunk of a man dropping a socket. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the escape chute, Korolev came with a bound. He spoke not a word, though he screamed quite a racket, and beat the technicians and threw on his jacket. He shoved me aside, called me a son of a whore, smashed the red button and the rocket rose with a roar. He sprang to his feet as the sirens did whistle, as we all dove for cover from the unruly missile. But I heard him exclaim as we dove out of sight, Happy New Year to all, and to all a good night. Hello and welcome to a special holiday episode of Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we take you through all the fun mistakes and explosions that made space exploration possible. We are your hosts, Quinn, Chris, and a festive Chris. And today we're going to be talking about the Soviet Christmas miracle. That was a missed opportunity to introduce ourselves as Chris Miss. Oh, God, uh, God damn it. All right. I, we're going back. Are we're we, doing we're going back for that. Are no. we? <laughs> yes, my... My Christmas elves, Chris and other Christmas. Oh, yeah. It could have just been a Christmas Chris. Oh, whatever. Just what Chris and Miss. Other Chris Kringle, whatever. But the long and the short of it is I wanted to apologize to you guys and I guess to the listeners as well after last time, whenever we talked about a very not fun topic. Um, and with the holidays right around the corner, I wanted to talk about a fun time. You know, a nice, a nice happy story, or it gets there at least. Trust me. So you guys remember the Soviet space dog program, yeah? I how how could we not forget that? Um, yeah, yeah. I have a I have a vivid recollection of sad times with the Soviet space okay. dog program. <laughs> I appreciate that you guys are like you guys sound like you're approaching this topic the same way you would like a crocodile that you were trying to poke. Like you're very. I told you to trust me. You are very. I'm not hearing it, you know, I to, hmm. to be fair, let's also consider what happened last time. Yeah, they were in fairness. I things. did not promise that the Bondarenko episode would be fun. That's true. So and, and this. OK, so this one, there's some slightly better vibes. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Or the failures make the vibes later that much better. You know, Ooh, good vibes right. become incredible when they're set against, you know, apocalyptically bad vibes. The vibe exchange. And today we are going to talk about Comet and Joke. The two Soviet space dogs that survived against incredible odds 
to bring Christmas home. That's a lot better. So right off the bat, I want to set the scene for you guys. So you really understand what it was like for these dogs and these engineers. So it's December 1960. And the engineers and technicians of the Soviet space program are in a race to put a man in orbit by the end of the year. There's nothing special or important about the date. The pressure is entirely political. See, KGB spies in America learned that NASA intended to launch an astronaut on a suborbital trajectory in early 1961, snatching the prize of first man in space. So, podcast favorite Nikita S. Khrushchev signed document 1011. And the 1011 here just means that it was signed on October 11th. God, he just really is spooked by everything. Oh, yeah. It is entirely like some KGB guys come to him and just say, hey, NASA's doing something. And he immediately slams the stamp down on solve this. Full on neuron activation. Okay, figure it out. Yeah. So this document, 1011, what it did was it put the entire priority of the Soviet space program on getting a man into orbit as soon as possible, hopefully for the holidays, and putting at their disposal any resources they need are favorite phrase yes can i have something for the holidays it would be nice to have something for the holidays <laughs> the fucking hand crunching down on your shoulder like squeezing in like a claw and just like hey man wouldn't it be nice to have something for the holidays hey man hey it would be nice to have something for the holidays like have you seen have you seen the constellations have you seen the northern lights from a gulag Oh, yeah, you have. Oh, man. Awesome. Cool. You remember Wouldn't that. Wouldn't it be nice to see something like that this time of year? Hmm? Wouldn't every little Soviet kid, can you imagine how happy they would be and how crushed they would be if that didn't happen? So, yeah, like he, he is fully leveraging all of the political will to get this done as soon as possible. This is also something that all of these engineers and technicians are used to. This is going to be something like the sixth, uh, the sixth or seventh satellite ever launched by the Soviets. And like fully half of those have been. Wouldn't it be nice to have something for the holidays? Um, they have not had many opportunities to not be rushed by Khrushchev. Hey, Khrushchev trotted out the line. They got to do it. It says right here in the contract. <laughs> yeah. And again, like this is fully they are being given all of the resources, all of the money. And if they can do it safely. Awesome. And if not, oh, well. And if they can't, <laughs> uh, you're doing it anyway. <laughs> well, who are you kidding? You didn't have an option. We're going to start out with the dog tests and then human golden retriever Yuri Gagarin is going to give it a go. I guess German Shepherd, considering the fash stuff. I don't I, I don't know what a fascist dog breed is. German Shepherd's close enough. Don't ask yeah, the I mean, German Shepherd enough. breed what they were doing between the years of 1939 and 1945. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> Dude, I wish I wish we're going to talk, talk about some of this later, but I wish dog science was more of a thing. I wish we had Operation Paperclip, all of the best German dog breeders. If we found out that that was the origin of like American dominance in kennel club competitions or something that would rule so hard. And, you know, these dogs that we're going to talk about, these are all mutts. Like the Soviets have lagged in the dog race. Maybe we did really get all of the dog breeders as part of paperclip. <laughs> now, despite the rush, Soviet engineers had reason to be optimistic. In August 1960, they had tested the new Vostok spacecraft and successfully recovered the first living beings from orbit, the space dogs Belka and Strelka. Um, so you'll also remember Laika made it to orbit but was not recovered. These are the first two dogs that go up and come down and and they don't die at any point in this, which is huge, which is. Cr yeah, which is, which is critical, more it important than the actual mission itself. Yes, <laughs> which if they're going. Yeah, like Khrushchev, he wants to put Yuri Gagarin in space. He would like for him to come back down alive. But I mean, it would be nice. I wonder if it ever floated across, like if it ever went across his mind. Like, I mean, we did it with Laika. <laughs> It'll work with him. Send Yuri up there with just like a little tin of poisoned dog food. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bud, there you go. <laughs> Enjoy. This when we tell you. So, yeah, like they had done this successfully before. They figured all they had to do was run a few more dog flights with the Vostok before it would be ready for Yuri Gagarin. And unlike the tensions and bad blood that flared up between American astronauts and chimpanots, the Soviet cosmonauts were mostly cool with their canine comrades. Um, Gagarin himself once joked, quote, I don't know whether I'm the first man in space or the last dog in space. <laughs> that, that's pretty good. We have a master truly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so for all of the weird and dumb stuff we've talked about with Yuri Gagarin, um, definitely go check out our episode and our interview with Andrew Jenks. He was very like personally charming. You cannot question that. So everything is looking good and the engineers are making progress toward the next dog launch until 
Two weeks after Khrushchev signs document 1011, disaster strikes. So have you guys ever heard of the Nadellan catastrophe? I am fairly familiar. I'm uh, sure I'm about to find out. Okay, you're not going to find out a lot because whenever we talk about this, and we will definitely talk about the catastrophe in detail sometime in the future, it'll be like a five-parter. But for right now, on October 24th, 1960, an experimental R-16 ballistic missile detonated on the launch pad, likely killing over 100 technicians, engineers, and the chief Soviet marshal of artillery, Mitrofan Nadellin, who caused most of the problems in the disaster and gave it its name. That sounds like it's the granddaddy of all failures to launch. Yeah, it is probably the deadliest event in space history. Because, again, with a lot of these, especially when uh, it's a toss-up between this and Intelsat 708 that we'll also talk about, in both cases, the government's likely covered up how many dead, and we just don't know. Oh, got some good old obfuscation going. Yeah. In both cases, likely over 100. Um, but the Nadellan catastrophe, it basically decapitated some of the Soviet Union's best rocket bureaus because they just had all of their people nearby looking at this thing whenever it exploded. Oh, A+. plus. Yeah, and it caused massive ripples all through rocket design that are still felt to this day. But for right now, and our holiday happy fun time story, it's a big problem because it grounded all rocket launches while they investigated the causes and, you know, like hosed all the people slurry off the launch pad. They can't launch their dogs. You can't. <laughs> but the launch pad is all clogged up with people juice. It's our Christmas dilemma. We can't launch <laughs> our rocket. There's too much people slurry on it. How are the dogs going to do their jobs? Oh, dude, the dogs would totally just be like licking it up. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Get Bulk out of there. <laughs> oh, I. Uh. You did this to yourself. Listeners, this is a fun story. Don't worry. The men. <laughs> the meat yeah. juice. So. All through November, Korolev sent increasingly desperate letters to the Kremlin, trying to get them to greenlight his launches. Like, he wanted the investigation of the Nadellan catastrophe, like, wrap it up, it doesn't matter, the rocket exploded, in order to be able to launch his dogs. He had a prototype capsule, he had a launcher, and he had his crew, he just needed approval. To try and sweeten the pot, he even went to the army and promised he'd tweak the orbit so that the spacecraft could be used as a test for new spy satellites he was developing for them. Oh, he is trying to work every angle at this point. Yes, absolutely. He is talking to anyone. He's like, yeah, like, dude, do, do you want me? Do you want the dogs to take pictures of America? Done. We will land the dogs on the White House green. <laughs> fun, fun, actual story there. Um, Belka, the, one of the first animals to come back alive. Um, one of her puppies was given to um, the Kennedys. Oh, yeah. Did they, did they did they have to stop to check her for bugs? Oh, dude, they absolutely did. They did. They did searches. They ran this dog through x-rays to make sure they hadn't like implanted a bug in it. We'll, we'll make sure to talk about that. That's not really a failure, but it's just a fun story. Uh, I believe it was named Fluffy. What a Fluffy. name. Yeah, bad, bad name for a space dog puppy, but still adorable. Yeah. So on November 24th, Korolev's persistence paid off and he was given approval to launch Karabl Sputnik 3 on December 1st. So the, the Karabl Sputnik 3, it basically refers to spacecraft. So the Karabl is spacecraft, Sputnik is satellite, and then the three, this is the third test launch of the Vostok spacecraft. The third attempt? Oh, no, no. Um, This is the just the third one. Like they've done a couple of test launches of this oh, thing without gotcha. people in it. They, they're not just going to do the one Belka and Stroka launch and then send Gagarin. They want to do a couple of like, basically the way it played out is that Belka and Stroka survived, but there were problems in the spacecraft that before they put a person, they have to make sure everything works. So they have to do a bunch more launches to sort out those problems. Gotcha. Now, despite the name, Karabl Sputnik 3 or Sputnik 6, as it was known in the West, was actually the fourth prototype of the Vostok spacecraft. And this is something we've talked about with the Cosmos system. And I have my own complaints about the Cosmos system. But the system that came before it was like the Soviet naming conventions were all over the place. And the Cosmo system is the only thing that kind of like sorted all of that out. So like the spacecraft that had successfully carried Belka and Stroka to orbit and back, it was basically just a pressurized sphere mounted on top of a small orbital stage. Its crew, a pair of dogs named Mushka and Pachelka, meaning little fly and little bee respectively, were kept inside a small pressurized container that sat on the capsule's ejection seat where a cosmonaut would normally go. See, the Vostok capsule is special even today because it is the only spacecraft whose crew was expected to eject and land separately from the actual, like, capsule. Yeah, that's weird. 
Yeah. And, and this also does get into like weird pseudo sour grapes arguments. You see a lot of um, people arguing that Yuri Gagarin can't be called the first man in orbit because he didn't land with his spacecraft and trying to do legalese to say that actually okay. the Americans were first. Uh, actually. Yeah, that is sour grapes. No, that yeah. That is. So uh, and you can also see right there a picture of Pachelka and Mushka, little bee and little fly. You mean little Pachelka. baby? Yeah. <laughs> And we were talking about this before the show. Um, if you're on YouTube, you'll be seeing these right now. Every Soviet space dog looks almost identical. Laika is honestly one of the only ones that stands out because she has a fur color that isn't just white. I believe there's another one's Vezdoshka that's just black. But otherwise, they you could not tell these dogs apart. Functionally identical. Yeah. And Mushka and Pachalka were not the only animals to fly. From space journalist Anatoly Zak. Quote, the group of live creatures aboard the descent module was complemented with guinea pigs, mice, and flies, as well as various biological specimens such as plant seeds, bacteria, viruses, and even rabbits' bone marrow. The BIOS experiment aboard the spacecraft was designed to attempt the first insemination in space by using fish eggs and sperm mixing during the flight inside an automated chamber. So this is, you know, all of these missions by this point, we're not just doing the propaganda stuff like every scientist is cramming this thing full of as much like biological science as they possibly as can. As much science as we can send. So, so yeah, like these, these dogs are in the capsule where the cosmonauts ejection seat would normally go. And then just around them is like cages of guinea pigs and rats and like the sperm centrifuge. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's <laughs> <laughs> As in, like, this is the device that's doing. The, there's like the fish eggs. Yeah, you said they were fish eggs, right? And fish, yeah. fish sperm, and they're just yeah. in the centrifuge and they spin it to get them. Yeah, to, and then to mix. and then uh, fish happens. <laughs> the nut sperm. I've never seen how fish spawn. I assume I assume it's uh, a lot of spinning. <laughs> well, I mean, they're there. You know, they just spray it everywhere, and they're fish, so they can just like yeah. But I mean, you, know, they yeah, just, you they don't just, want they that in you don't their, want that in zero g. It they would go everywhere. Their fins yeah. and you know that kind of like you know they have to appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> so I can see why the mechanical assistance then would be useful because in space, that's like that's just going everywhere. zero g. The the dogs wouldn't enjoy that. Imagine if they had sent the actual fish and not just their particulates. <laughs> <laughs> the fish are in the centrifuge and are being spun. Just, as there a, is no as water. A, hey, hey, you guys got to jerk off. Come on. We're on a strict time. <laughs> the, the, the centrifuge is simply to agitate the animal so that it, 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 it. <laughs> so that it reproduces. Now, if everything went well, Karabal Sputnik 3 would only orbit for about a day. That's how things are supposed to go. Do you guys want to guess how they actually went? Horrifically. Not swimmingly. But on Tish. <laughs> The fish failed to bust. What happened was everything went fine at first. The spacecraft reached orbit and the Soviet propaganda machine immediately kicked into high gear, making sure everyone knew all about it. Um, satellite launches were still pretty uncommon back then, and both sides treated them like a big deal. For the entire time the dogs were in orbit, radio stations around the world recorded and relayed the signals coming off of the spacecraft. Hey. And, and again, like this is the... Uh, this is Sputnik 6, as it's known. This is the sixth public Soviet satellite launch ever. Like, these are still a huge deal. People yeah. stay up late to watch these things go overhead. Because it's awesome. Yeah. Up in space, the mission went normally until it was time for re-entry. And to explain what happened next, I'm going to go back to, quote, Anatoly Zak. Despite the activation of the braking engine, the subsequent separation of the descent module and the instrument module had not taken place. Next, ground controllers registered the activation of the APO self-destruct mechanism, followed by the abrupt disappearance of radio signals from the spacecraft. Uh oh, they they hit the kill button. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Did we just blow up our animals? <laughs> so now, the... you guys might be wondering what the fucking APO self-destruct mechanism is. Sir, did the sperm survive? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, see, every Vostok spacecraft that didn't have a living human in it was packed with explosives, all wired to an automatic self-destruct system. Beautiful. They were they just terrified. They simply didn't want to deal with the political after or the political fallout of their uh, science probe landing in uh, allied territory. Their animals well, yeah. being abducted and interrogated and then returned to them with bugs. The dogs being compromised to a permanent end. Getting the getting terrified that the dogs will talk, so you treat you train them to bite down on a suicide squeaky toy if captured. <laughs> <laughs> that is a cursed concept. Oh, 
Comrade Dog, do not believe the American lies of full bowls and wet food. <laughs> you must die as a hero to the Soviet Union. Go forth with pride, Comrade. I stole that from our friend Matt. The dogs will be compromised to a permanent end. They need to protect the top secret dog science. We cannot allow the Americans or the Chinese to figure out how these dogs work. We are decades ahead of their dogs. You don't understand. They're too good. And at the end of the day, this kind of makes sense because the Vostok itself was the most cutting edge thing the Soviet Union had ever produced. Really, it was the most advanced thing humans, period, had ever produced in history up to that time. The Soviets could not afford it falling into the enemy hands. This is like the definition of a state secret. As such, they were incredibly worried about a wayward Vostok landing in China or near the US and blowing their lead in the space race. And this was reflected in the self-destruct mechanism. See, it could be activated remotely by a signal from the ground, but because a problem could happen anywhere and the Vostok was out of communications range for like big chunks of its orbit, the system was mostly automated and it was coded with a series of if then statements that basically just boil down to if anything goes the tiniest bit wrong, detonate. Dogs are turned. Dogs become slurry. Dogs become too anxious. Detonate. <laughs> well, that's bad. What kind of horrifying saw trap is this? <laughs> it's the machine that turns dogs into a soup like a it. <laughs> Oh my god. So I'll give you an example. If an engine burned too long, detonate. If the spacecraft started to tumble and couldn't get back control within X number Kill of seconds, dogs. detonate. And if anything went even the tiniest bit wrong with the re-entry, you can bet it's gonna detonate. It, it's literally designed to speed run Why killing do dogs. This? The best thing about this is like, I don't have it, but I did have some fun reading through all of this and trying to like recreate the if then statements that this thing was programmed with. And it's all like this horrible nested thing of timers that all lead back to one point that just says detonate. That just says kill the dog. This is like temperature goes too high, detonate, temperature goes too low. Like if anything, any parameter you can imagine goes outside of a norm for X number of seconds, boom. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing. But and again, this was not a tiny bomb. This was enough to fully destroy the spacecraft. It had to be because they had to make sure that nothing would survive, like not even fragments of dog. Your dogs are being evaporated. <laughs> Gone, reduced to atoms. So that is what went wrong with Karabal Sputnik 3. There was a problem with the reentry. The spacecraft wound up on an extra orbit and, quote, the APO was automatically triggered after the flight control system missed the required time marker for the atmospheric entry measured by a G-force sensor. So if G-force is not at X level by Y seconds, then detonate. Christ's sake. Yeah. Uh, it, this is the you, Christmas you, episode, You can understand everyone. it. You can understand why there was a bomb there, but just like the chilling levels of, I'm just like, I'm thinking about this as like a Hallmark movie, except it's, you know, the dog, <laughs> our, our, our cosmonaut heroes uh, have to do their science mission. But like the antagonist of the movie is just ourselves. And yeah. <laughs> the, the, the pod is set to explode under any number of anomalous condition circumstances. Yeah. Like it, it really is like this computer was most of this was just operating on like timers. And, and for context, we'll get to this later. Parts of the APO, because they predicted that like there would be electronic and computer failures, part of the APO just had like a little spring loaded detonator. Um, it was not fully electronic. There was also Christ. just like after launch, if it was not disarmed within 60 hours, detonate <laughs> uh, like this. This computer, this machine was very dumb. But to me, it just like this is a rogue computer trying to blow up the spacecraft. This is action movie shit. It wants to consume the dogs. It, it wants nothing more yeah, than to blow up the dogs, every guinea pig, all the rats, all the mice, the rats, are all, the, all the fish sperm. It wants to consume all of the contained life and then itself. <laughs> not, no, not the fish sperm, anything but that. So listener, do not worry. Bits of space dogs snowing down on eastern China is not the Christmas miracle I was talking about. This is just the preamble to our happy fun time story. So we are now down to space dogs. More importantly, it is looking more and more likely that Khrushchev is not going to get his New Year's cosmonaut flight. Uh-oh. So, <laughs> That's not good for a lot of people. No. And they were so desperate to put a good spin on this that they went to Khrushchev and told him that the APO system had been successfully tested and that made it a success. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we just need a dog. Are you happy, sir? Dude, do you want to see the pictures? 
You wouldn't believe what this did to the. It's just the comer. It's just the comer of Cook Funeral, but a little tinier. Sir, the, we're happy to report that the self-destruct mechanism is working correctly. Uh, in fact, we know that it's working so well because we recovered the probe. We found, yeah, the the tiniest bit of dog we recovered is actually microscopic, which means that the detonation worked perfectly. If we had failed, we'd have recovered entire, you know, grams of dog. You'll be happy to know that they will not discover our fish sperm. <laughs> they will never learn about our centrifuge comb technology. <laughs> <laughs> Mao just like sitting in a lab watching a dude on a bicycle slowly spin a centrifuge <laughs> manually. It's like, <laughs> damn it. Uh, Ow, Koo. Koo is being a hellion today. Hell yeah. He was on something this morning. How did you know? I was there when the event happened. Oh no. He has been incredibly obnoxious. He's attention seeking. And then, like, like more always, so than normal? Oh, yes. And then and then, you know, when you give it to him. He just wants to attack you. So <laughs> it's just claws and fangs and that's all he'll offer. He hates, you know? Yeah, we should put him in the rocket. <laughs> we should. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if anything, if anything, his tenacity to survive will see him through. Yes, if the bomb. If the, the APO claw wants his way to, through the APO. Yeah, if the APO wants to blow him up, he's going to have chewed clean through <laughs> all of the the wires necessary to do so long uh, before the conditions are met. He'll make it back to Khrushchev's office. My cat wouldn't do that. My cat would. My cat she would, would just be sit there. She would sit there, and she would have no idea what's going on. It's like will become soup. Now, even if they weren't going to launch Gagarin by the end of 1960, the pace of the Vostok program never slowed, and before the last little bits of dog confetti had reached the ground, <gasps> Korolev and his engineers were already planning another mission with another pair of brave canine cosmonauts. And that is how, just three weeks after the last mission failed. Parabol Sputnik 4 was launched on December 22nd of 1960. I'm assuming that these follow the same theme of uh, they picked stray dogs. Yep. Like right off the bat, there is some confusion about which dogs were launched or what their names were. Most sources agree that the dogs were named Kometa, meaning Comet, and Shutka, meaning Joke. Uh, but it's also possible that Comet was named Little Thief and Joke was named Pearly. Aw, I like Little Thief. But for the sake of our story, I'm going to stick with Comet and Joke. Um, and it's not Jokester. It, it, it is literally just like this dog is a joke. This dog was trained wrong as a joke. But to answer your question, uh, yeah, these are these are trained street dogs. But these are also veterans of several launches. These are about as trained as a dog can possibly get. These are, are these are the apex tier dogs. Yeah. And these they have proven themselves on numerous rocket launches before. They've rolled the dice enough times to not be blown up by the APO. Yeah. Like if you can say that a dog has the right stuff, Comet and Joke have the right stuff. So these dogs launch on December 22nd, 1960, three weeks after the earlier failure. And unlike uh, the Karabal Sputnik 3 launch, where things went perfectly until, until things suddenly exploded, this mission goes wrong right away. Five minutes after launch, while the rocket is still climbing up through the atmosphere, ground crews detect that the third stage engine cut off a full four minutes earlier than it was supposed to. So this put the spacecraft on a high suborbital arc that, while it would reach an altitude of over 200 kilometers and like go to space zero G and all that, it was nowhere close to orbital velocity. Worse, because this was definitely in the system's definition of something going wrong, everyone on the ground assumed that the APO self-destruct system had already blown the spacecraft to bits. Cue scene of mission control on everyone's solemn faces. <laughs> yeah, someone just like with the logic of the APO written out on a piece of paper, just like checking things off one by one, like, yeah, that happened, that happened, that happened. Flash uh, it to should... our two heroes rocketing through space on a loud rocket, it's having a great time. On, sitting on top of a bomb. And yet, they were able to track this thing all the way till it landed. The APO, for some reason, did not go off. So, first miracle right there. A few minutes after losing contact with the rocket, radio tracking stations as far away as Moscow started picking up a signal coming from the capsule's parachute. It had the antennas woven into the canopy. Oh, that's actually pretty cool. That is Despite really all cool. of the fail-safes and problems, it was floating to the ground somewhere deep in Siberia. Yeah, like, and this kicks off an incredibly rushed recovery operation. All of the people who were getting ready to recover the spacecraft, like the actual recovery team, they are somewhere entirely else, and they are expecting it a day later. So they are not the people who get sent. Oh, we got the B team going in for this one. 
Oh, yeah. Now, there are a couple of reasons for the rush to get to this capsule. First, even though the capsule has life support and can keep animals safe from the 40 degree Siberian weather, the dogs were meant to be ejected out before landing, and the container that they were in couldn't protect them for shit. If it worked as intended, the dogs would almost certainly freeze to death before Cruz could find them. Oh, popsicles. Chris, did you just call them popsicles? Popsicles, yeah. And so the second reason is the APO. And the APO at this point is kind of becoming my favorite character. It is the villain. <laughs> if if this is a Christmas if this is a Christmas play, then the APO is the villain. Yes. It's the, this is the machine. It is designed to kill dogs. Oh. I'm going to get art of a bomb with a snidely whiplash mustache on it, and that's going to be the APO. <laughs> it's the bomb that wants to ruin Christmas. So on top of all of its other commands, the APO has a timer and will detonate 60 hours after landing, if not disarmed. This is like the final, final failsafe of this bomb. Beautiful. And like you said, we are getting the B team. So the man picked to lead this recovery effort was an engineer who had worked on the dog container, ironically named Vostokov. Um, and this is some real Jack Ryan, I'm just an analyst shit, because he's just a mechanical engineer who had happened to work on this part. He has no experience with any of this, and he's being sent into 40 degree, uh, why did I say 40? Minus 40 degree weather with no preparation in the middle of Siberia. And he's the only shot that these dogs got. <sighs> God damn it. He, he also does kind of have uh, some backup. Uh, I oh, guess it is, it is kind of like some Jack Ryan stuff because he has a military uh, explosives expert coming with him, except this guy has not been told how the APO system works. He's just they just trust that like, hey, he's an explosives guy. He'll know. Yeah, he knows things that go boom. They're all everything that goes boom is the same. <laughs> yeah, I work with bombs that normally have like one trigger, maybe two. Why does this bomb have 50 triggers? Why does this bomb want to obliterate human life? He can he can <laughs> smell the explosive compound. You have to bring him with you. <laughs> Sniffing his he'll way help through you Siberia. Find, he'll help you find where the where the where the rocket crashed. <laughs> now, the launch happened on December 22nd. December 23rd was spent just getting these two dudes to Siberia because they picked two dudes who lived on the other side of the Soviet Union. Oh, the explosives expert dude is from Leningrad. So they have to fly him out there. Finally, on the morning of the 24th, two days after the mission launch, with just a handful of hours left on the APO timer, a spotter plane managed to track down the capsule and the two men took a helicopter to the site. Now, this did not mean that things were going well. The capsule had come down in a field of basically shoulder high snow that made it almost impossible to reach. Uh, the helicopter dropped them off 20 meters from the Vostok, and it still took them hours to carve a path to it. Wow. Yeah. And I want to remind you, this is in minus 40 degree weather. And by the time they reach the capsule, there's only about four hours left on the APO. I just I want to clarify. Is it just these two two like these two guys? Yeah, that's it. I mean, they've got Nobody the helicopter else. crew there. No one else. They are the away team here. They will eventually get a bigger recovery crew, but these guys are just sent to like, dude, get there, get the dogs, make sure it doesn't explode because the actual recovery crew is still off in like uh, Kazakhstan and they were caught completely unprepared. Nice. Man, the thought of having to go from Kazakhstan to Siberia. In fairness, this guy, this guy was actually coming from Moscow to Siberia. Nice, nice, wonderful Moscow. And then right to like middle of nowhere. Siberia. <laughs> That's just a pile of sock. I, I feel like this would be the kind of thing, like if if my boss came to my desk and just said, like, hey, do you want to go on like a work trip? Sure. Where? Where are we going? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere in the Northwest Territories. Here's your ticket. Here's your partner. He knows bombs. <laughs> <laughs> what now? Get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing Vostokov noticed was that even though the Vostok's main hatch had blown off as intended, uh, the dogs had not been ejected for some reason. Their pod was still inside, and while they were shivering, Comet and Joke were both alive. Yes. Unfortunately, some of the other cargo was not so lucky. The mice did not make it. What about the sperm? I don't know. Tragically, I assume they froze. <laughs> Poor little guys. <laughs> Death toll of this mission, several thousand. <laughs> Brackets, sperm, individually. And a handful of rats. <laughs> So even weirder, the actual ejection mechanism was completely missing. Like, apparently it activated and just flew away without bringing the dogs with it. OK, that's great. Um, <laughs> and we'll get to this later. This is because, like, things go so wrong that they they break in exactly the right way for these dogs to survive. We literally um, horseshoot back into the dogs living somehow. Yeah. 
So like Vostokov is trying to figure out like how this weird, interesting engineering problem happened while this military dude is standing by like tapping his watch meaningfully <laughs> because they're how- still on the clock. And and they have by this point four hours left on the timer, the theoretical timer, assuming the bomb isn't going to go wrong and like detonate immediately. Explosives guy is pondering just how many kilos are sitting in this <laughs> thing ready to turn him into mist. Oh, uh, Quote, they had some ropes with them, which they wrapped around the cabin and pulled it off of the capsule. Fortunately, the cabin easily slid off its guide rails. The explosive specialist immediately dove inside the cabin and quickly disconnected the cables of the APO mechanism, finally eliminating the danger of an explosion. Nice. We I made it. Story. Yeah, the APO is dead. It's vanquished. It's gone. Now we're just stranded in the middle of Siberia with a helicopter <laughs> crew, two dogs, and this <laughs> annoying scientist analyst guy. Uh, oh just, man, I just I saved the day, but now what? We're stranded. Trying to light the plastic explosive on fire for warmth. Accidentally setting it off. APO yeah. has served its purpose. But it, yeah, salvaging the C4 out of the APO to do tiny little warmth explosions. <laughs> Seeing if you can tauntaun a small uh, street dog. <laughs> Turning a small street dog or, into a... Oh, sorry, the mice. The mice are already dead. Yeah, the, <laughs> mice, the mice, but the mice are long, like Cold, you know they have been yeah, dead that's for a fair. while. That's fair. I, yeah, I mean, I, you could make like a nice mouse fur cloak. No, mice gloves. Yeah. So, twelve hours after the APO is shut off, right at midnight on Christmas Eve, a bigger recovery team arrived. They get the dogs out of their pods, and everything is airlifted to the nearby town of Tura. Hey. Yeah. Once they are out of the cold, Comet and Joke make a full recovery, and they are even reported to be in good spirits, running around and yapping. Oh, we love a win. Yeah. But what actually happened? And why is this a Christmas miracle instead of just a story that happened to happen right around Christmas? Basically, everything on this mission failed in just the right way for Comet and Joke to survive. Like most spacecraft, the Vostok is made of different parts that separate when they're no longer useful. Um, so whenever the spacecraft is getting ready for re-entry, it dumps the orbital section and you're just left with like the spherical descent stage. Normally, these two parts are connected by an umbilical, a big wire harness that like links their computers together. And on Carabal 4, the umbilical didn't separate. Actually, part of it sheared off and the rest got melted by re-entry heat. And because of that failure, none of the like the ejection seat had malfunctioned. The APO had malfunctioned. All of these things are caused by this umbilical, like this one piece that like didn't detach properly. It just failed catastrophically. And because of that, like, and it's also possible the APO wouldn't have even exploded after the 60 hours. Um, like they had no way of knowing how damaged it was. If things had worked as intended, the dogs would probably have blown up in space. And even if they hadn't, they'd have been ejected into the Siberian like snow and just frozen to death. Lost forever. Yes. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, be, being pulled out of the ice like a mammoth. Except it's just like wearing a little a little cosmonaut jacket. Yeah. So, listener, this is just to show that sometimes failures save lives. So, you know, maybe they're good. Maybe we should have more of them. Yeah. Maybe things should just continue to go wrong in just the right way. Fail forwards. So, yeah, yeah, like, you know, however many failures you have, some of them, if you fail a lot, maybe you'll actually wind up winning. And from a lot of our episodes, you might expect like a horrible twist ending, like the dogs getting dissected or something. Uh, but everyone here mostly gets happy endings. Comet was adopted by Oleg Gazenko, the head of the Soviet space dog program, lived another 14 years and had a load of puppies. Aww. We do not know what happened to Joke, but retired space dogs were normally adopted by scientists, and we do know that she never flew again. So, decently happy there. Let's just say, I think one is enough in this case. <laughs> And happiest of all was the Kremlin, who announced to the world on Christmas morning that a suborbital rocket test had gone perfectly. It turns out it was never even meant to go to orbit and that nothing went wrong ever. The end. Fantastic. Another, yeah. <laughs> another, another great holiday another experience. Another flawless mission for the Soviet space program. Another great Congrats, holiday guys. experience. Just thank you, Nikita Khrushchev. Thank yeah. you for another great holiday experience. <laughs> God. Oh, he didn't quite not, get his. It was not the iron gauntlet ripping my shoulder into oblivion. <laughs> and in complete fairness, Korolev did want to announce this as a failure because, uh, like, basically, the Soviets were well aware that no one in the world actually believed them whenever they said that they had like a 10 and 0 success rate. And Korolev 
himself wanted to be more like, no, 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 we should tell the truth because otherwise people are going to doubt us whenever we launch Gagarin, which spoiler alert is something that happened. Mm -hmm. He didn't get that. The propaganda won. And instead we got Christmas morning, happy flight dogs. Yeah, that's what I want. I want dogs not evaporating. Yeah. But for you guys, for Chris's, for all of Christum. Wait, no, hold on. I mean, something else. Uh, uh, no, it's, no, sorry. It's, that's no, Christendom. Right. No, okay. yeah, I was going to say you're right. It's Christendom. If No, this, no this but I, I meant Christendom is, as in all of the Chris's. Yeah, and that's 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 correct. Christendom is for Chris's. OK, cool, cool, cool. For, for all for all the Chris's out there, for all of our listeners. Yeah, this was to give a bit of a palate cleanser after our last one. After pain. And also to thank all of our listeners for all of the uh, to all of our listeners to thank them for their dedicated viewership yeah yeah thank you for your continuing support. thank you for sticking with us <laughs> as we blunder from topic to topic good and bad dead dogs dead people blowing up rockets and to to any of our listeners who have joined us this year we have a lot more fun stuff coming to any listeners who are real old veterans thank you for all of your continued devotion this year has been big for us both in terms of growth but also in terms of like getting interviews finding new and exciting people to talk to and we have a lot more of that planned in the future uh, i'm not sure exactly when it's going to happen i know i've been i've i know i've been saying a lot of these are on the horizon for a while now but we do intend to do our series on space food and we do have a lot of props lined up that's going to be very fun oh yeah so yeah however you celebrate it from everyone here at Failure to Launch, thank you for all your devotion. Have a have a good holiday period, however you celebrate it. We'll see you all in the year, yeah, 2024. Hopefully, I actually got myself bets. mixed up there. I almost said 2025. I fucked that up. But we just go on a that, year hiatus. <laughs> that would be fun, though. To like next year's podcast today. Thank you for listening to Failure to Launch. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review or tell a friend. Everything helps. If you want to follow us, contact us, or suggest a topic, you can email us at launchfailurepodcast at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at launch underscore failure. Failure to Launch is hosted on Anchor, and we post on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. We also post our episodes with visual aids on YouTube at Failure to Launch. All music was provided by DJ Danarchy.